Hi, everyone. I am Jessica Schklar. I'm a managing director at MBA Mission. We are one of the leading uh, MBA Mission consulting firms. And I am delighted to welcome you all here to talk about resumes. I am going to give you a quick background on who I am and then um, dive into going through some resume questions, uh, some resume slides. If you have questions on resumes, I'll take them then. If there's interest in my going on and talking about other parts of the application, I can do that after we finish with the questions. But the focus of this is on resumes. So in terms of my background, um, I did go to Harvard undergrad. I then worked in admissions for a small little cons uh, admissions firm, uh, so a small little university out in California, um, where I was in the admissions office. And I traveled around the country giving presentations on how do you write application essays? How do you pick the right school for you? Uh, it was a very small school, so we really were just trying to get the word out. Um, at some point in there, I realized I needed to go to business school. I applied to five schools, and I got into all five. I applied to Harvard, Stanford, Kellogg, Yale, and UCLA. And I ended up going to Harvard again for business school. I then worked in the corporate world for a while. I was the senior vice president and quality leader at Chase Home Finance. And now I've been with MBA Mission for 13 years. Um, and I never really left admissions. I always volunteered in the New York City public schools or helping my friends with business school applications. But now I've done this for 13 years with MBA Mission. I love everything about it. I love helping people tell their stories and um, figure out who they are. I want to talk about this resume. I was really excited when GMAT Club asked me to do this one because I feel like resumes kind of get overlooked. Um, and it's one of those areas where a lot of people think like, oh, I have a resume. I can just add my current job and it, I'm done. And I think that does you a disservice. So let me get started. Oh, and by the way, if you have questions, please put them in the comments uh, in the chat and I will address them. Um, maybe not instantly because I want, might want to finish the slide, but I will get through any resume related questions um, while I'm talking. So the focus of this conversation is on resume. Let me give you a little bit of an overview. When I say here, why do other parts of the application matter? By other parts, I'm really meaning everything outside of the GMAT and the essays, because those other parts are often what get overlooked, right? You spend so much time prepping for your GMAT or GRE, and you spend so much time on your essays, and then you forget that there are other parts of the application. So I break application components into the qualification components and the selection components. So what I mean by that is, there are parts of your application that simply serve to tell the admissions office that you are qualified. So that could be your scores, your work experience, which is on your resume, the application itself. I feel like those answer the what question. What have you achieved? Then once you have that pool of people who are qualified, there are still lots and lots of selection process to go because they can't accept everyone who's qualified. That's where the selection comes in. Those are the who are you, right? So we have the what have you done and the who are you components. That's really the essays and the um, recommendations, which kind of straddle between the two. So the essays tell them who you are, how you will contribute to the class, why the class is going to be better for uh, having you in it. So uh, that's what this is not about. We are here to talk about the what components because you're spending lots of time on your essays. And of course, you can always do a free consultation with us to talk about your profile and your story and things like that. But today, I want to really focus on the um, one of the qualification components, which is your resume. So why do other parts of the application matter? Right? You're spending so much time on the GMAT and so much time on the essays. And so it's sometimes easy to get sloppy on the, the other components, right? By which I mean the application and the resume primarily. But admissions officers need those other documents to get to know you, to be able to get kind of a quick snapshot overview before they dive into the essays. Your essays, let's say, for example, the Kellogg essay one, when it's time that you added value, that's a deep dive into one story but you're much more than one story. And so the resume serves to give them that overview of everything you've been doing from college on. Obviously you can't tell everything, but it is that overview, that snapshot that says to them, 
I can now place this person in context, and now I can do the deep dive to get to know them through the essays. So, and they also are looking to build a diverse class. They really do want people from all kinds of backgrounds. So that's why these other components matter. You also cannot say everything in the essays because there are word count limits. And it often is the first thing that the admissions office will see. We can't guarantee that some admissions readers might start with the essays, but for the most part, when I get a consultation in, I, you know, I look at the resume, I'm like, okay, who is this person overall? Then I might dive into some specific other aspects. So this is just kind of a way to assess it and first impressions do matter. So you want this material to be clean and clear and tell them a story of who you are. Okay, so let's get into these, um, list the components. These are the, again, the what qualification. This just tells them what you have done. Test scores, GPA. Can't do much about your GPA now, although you could take some additional courses. Additional designations, these are certifications you've done. The resume, which is what we're talking about today, and the application itself. Um, I have slides on that if you want them, if we get to them, but if you other have, have questions, we'll focus on your questions. But the application itself, take a look open up the application, start one and go through, you'll see there's hundreds of questions, like just you know, give the description of your company, list your responsibilities, um, how many siblings do you have and their ages. It's just lots and lots of pages of kind of nitty gritty information. This footnote here, the applications are reviewed holistically, schools do not have cutoffs or minimum qualifications. That is absolutely critical when I'm talking about these qualification documents, because just because you might not hit a certain threshold on your score or your grades does not mean that they're automatically rejecting you, right? So I, I, it's just so important that you realize that it's not just about these qualification documents. Though it's not like if you don't have certain test scores, the door shuts and they won't even bother reading your essays. They might give more scrutiny to your essays, but they really are looking holistically. I had a client last year who got accepted to MIT and Stanford with a GRE score that was probably close to 10 points, below, you know, maybe six to eight points below the average, but was a fantastic applicant in every other way. So I just say that because it's important that you realize we're not doing cutoffs. However, it is important to talk about these qualification items as well. Um, just gonna take a quick pause, see if there are questions that have come up so far. Uh, there is a question on gaps. We're going to, I'll get to that. Okay. Um, thank you for the question. Okay. So let's go over some guidelines on the resume. One page, except for EMBA programs. Okay. If you've been working for more than 10 years, you're applying to executive MBA programs, you could do two pages. The only two times I can ever remember in 13 years of doing this, that I have let an applicant do a two page resume was one, I had a PhD student who had applicant who had 25 publications. So his second page of his resume had no other content but 25 um, publications. And similarly, I had a, a client who was an entrepreneur who had won over a dozen awards for her business. And so we did a second page simply of business awards. So it was not even a resume as much as additional information. That's twice in 13 years. Don't put that in unless that's you. Um, so it's one page, but you can't go smaller than 10 point font. <laughs> and you cannot have margins that are so small it makes it impossible. You're trying to make a good first impression with your resume. And if the first impression is this applicant doesn't know how to prioritize, isn't considerate of our ability to read the application, the, the resume quickly, then you're automatically not giving the best first impression. So it's not just the content that matters. It is overall, the like schools want to know, can you prioritize and pick the most important things to share with us? And can you tell your story succinctly and clearly? Um, you do not need, this is interesting, right? Your address, because it comes with your application. So have your name, don't make your name more than 14 point size. And then have under your name, you can have your email address and your phone number. If you want to put your LinkedIn profile there too, that's fine, all on one line. But you can save space because you do not need to put your mailing address on that resume since it goes with your application. You don't really need technical qualifications. If you work in investment banking, you do not need a line that says skills in Excel, right? 
they the schools will know that you have the tools to do your job. So if you're a programmer and an engineer, you don't need to list all the languages you know how to program in. You would want that for a professional resume, but business schools truly don't care. And they assume that you know how to use the tools to do your job. Um, courses taken during college, remember that they will have your transcript. So unless you really want to highlight it, like you have, you know, you're an English major, but you took five finance classes, you know, maybe I could see putting it there, but it's probably going to be the first thing I'll cut if you send me your resume and it's too long. Um, and then you do not need an executive summary or a purpose. You don't need the line references available on request. You don't need a photograph. Uh, those are all things I've seen that none of that's necessary for a business school resume. It should be easily scannable. Your admissions reader is going to look at it and they want to capture the key points. They want to look and say, oh, I know where they went to school. I know what they did during school. I know wh where they've worked. Um, see, I can see promotions and I know um, who they are and right? what they do outside of work. Right? I encourage you to start with what you're doing now. It's tempting to start with education. But often what that means is you are leading with something that happened four, five, six years ago. And so why would you want to do that? You want to lead with what you're doing now. That might change once you get to business school, because then you would lead with education because you're in business school. And that's what you're doing now. But when you're working, unless you're in graduate school right now uh, or you know, undergrad, you're applying to deferred programs, you should start with your work experience and then list jobs in your reverse chronological order. Have clear and well-defined sections. Professional, education, community, personal. I usually only have three, actually. I have my clients do professional or experience, education, and then additional. If there are certain things you want to highlight, like you've been working, but you also have this entrepreneurship background on the side, you could have a subcategory under experience for entrepreneurship. Uh, same with military or leadership, although I, I don't really love key, a, a leadership section because I think that should come through through the bullet points, which we'll talk about. This is a really key pull, bullet point here, the second to last one, the education section should not be purely academic, but should demonstrate how engaged you were during school. Why does that matter? You're applying to be a vital member of a community in business school. So the admissions office is going to look and say, how can we tell that Joe is going to be a vital member of our business school class? Oh, I know. Let's look and see how active he was in the community in college. Wow, Joe didn't do anything in college. Yeah, he's probably not going to really contribute to clubs or activities here in business school either. That's not the message you want to send. You want to send the message that you were very active in college, or at least somewhat active in college, so that the schools can say, this is someone who gets engaged in every part of his life or her life. Right. In college, activities outside, in their job, this is someone who throws themselves into the activities, the life around them. So I always have a section under the education. I have a bullet point for academic honors, a bullet point for study abroad, bullet point for transferred from, and I have a bullet point for activities. And that's where I have my clients list their leadership or participation during college. So clubs, fraternities, um, research, things like that, I put under college so that that college section is robust. And please remember, schools that have blind interviews, that means it's an alum interview or an admissions office student interview, and while they have, will have read your entire application to select you for the interview, your interviewer only ever sees your resume. Okay, so the schools that are not blind where your interviewer will have read the whole application, Harvard, London Business School, MIT, and NYU are pretty much the only ones or certainly the biggest ones. Darden, your interviewer won't even look at your resume. All the other schools, your interviewer is only going to see your resume. So you need it to be comprehensive because you can't look at it and say, oh, I know that that, um, that other aspect is on in my, one of my essays, so I don't need to include it here. Now, that a little bit does contradict what I said earlier, that you don't need to include your address or your um, school coursework because it comes with the application. But that's because the interviewer doesn't need to know that. right? The interviewer needs your phone number and your email, which will be on the resume. And they don't need to know what classes you took in college. 
if they're curious, they'll ask. They're much more interested about your professional trajectory. Okay. All right. I'm going to just again double check for questions. Don't see any new ones. Um, so. All right. So let's go on. Um, resume guidance. I'm going to spend a couple of slides here talking about the most important aspect of your resume, which is uh, the bullet points themselves. Okay, this is what I see almost everybody do wrong at the beginning, and it is so important to get it right. It really differentiates you. So the bullet points should be one to two lines each. Occasionally, you can have a three-line bullet point, but I wouldn't do you know lots of those, and I wouldn't do anything really longer than that. It's hard to read. Doesn't say it on here, but I would also not um, double justify so that it's you know it's all even on both sides. Um, that creates weird gaps, it also gets rid of white space. And you really do want to have white space built into the resume to make it easier to read. Okay. Avoid jargon. Why is that important? Someone want to type to me in the comments? Why is it important to avoid jargon? Anyone, anyone? It's not that tricky a question. Okay, so um, you don't know that your interviewer uh, or that the admissions reader is going to know be from your industry. They might not know that jargon. And now you've put up a barrier in helping them get to know you. Um, it also is often not as relevant to the admissions office. And I'll give you an example in a couple more slides. Um, yep, thank you, Anjani, exactly. The interviewer might not be from the same sector, the admissions reader as well. Um, and also it, while the jargon, the specific computer programming languages, or that you know, that kind of thing might be very important in a professional re resume because your interviewer, the place you're applying, needs to know that you know that. In business school, they care much more about your impact. That's that third bullet point. This is what I think most people get wrong initially, right? Most people talk about their responsibility. So here's your test. Okay? Read a bullet point and say, does this bullet point describe my job or does it offer evidence that I'm good at my job? Okay. It's so important. Does the bullet point describe my job or does it offer evidence that I'm good at my job? And another question is, am I the only one in my organization who can write that? You want your bullet points to show that you're good at your job, to show that you've had impact and to be unique to you. Okay, so let's go through a couple of examples. Here's one. Worked on several deals and pitches, including sell side and buy side, M&A, LBOs, and debt and equity financing. How good is this person at their job? What's the impact this person has had? We don't know. Are they the only one in their organization who can write this bullet point? Definitely not. Okay. Take an honest look at your resume in your head right now. Have you, do you have bullet points that say this? Do you see how this is a job description? The job description of an analyst is to work on deals and pitches, including sell side and buy side, M&A, LBOs, and debt and equity financing. Okay. It's not unique. It doesn't tell them anything about you. Led a $19 million upsizing of the debt financing at an operating company, a 5,000 acre organic farm with minimal oversight, enabled the company to take a dividend of X percent only a year into the investment, outperforming the underwriting case. Okay. Now it is longer, it is that three lines, that's fine. Um, but now do you see the difference? Do you see that this is something that only this person can write? And you see the impact. We know how well this person did at this project. Okay. They led, so you start with a leadership word. Okay. Start with a leadership word, led, organized, oversaw, managed, initiated, drove, coordinated, right? Then the action, a $19 million upsizing of the debt financing and operating company with minimal oversight. And now the impact enabled the company to take a dividend only a year into the investment outperforming the underwriting case. I'm gonna go through that again. 
um, really important. There, and by the way, you can download from our website at, um, under publications a free resume guide that goes over a lot of this also. Um, so three parts to each bullet point. Start with a leadership word, then the impact. I'm sorry, start with a leadership word, then the action, you know, what you did that leadership to, and then the impact, which resulted in. So here's another one. Develop strategic business solutions to advise businesses on corporate strategy and transactions in 12 engagements. This is a tiny bit better because it starts with a leadership word, but, and there is 12 engagements. So maybe there are other people in the organization who couldn't say that because they didn't do 12. We don't really know. Maybe everyone else was doing 20. Maybe everyone else was doing six. We don't have much context, but fundamentally this is also not a very good bullet point, right? develop strategic business solutions to advise businesses. On, that's again, a job description, right? So a different way of saying that, you see this again follows that same three part approach, which is start with the leadership word, then the action or the target of the action, and then the impact. Built and analyzed customer survey, market sizing model, and third party retail store sales data to assess potential target of $200 million pet food distributor presented synthesized findings and recommendations to client, which acquired target in 321. I like this bullet point because it shows you that impact does not always have to have a number associated with it, right? The previous one did, the dividend, but this one said the impact is that the findings the company was acquired, therefore their work was valuable, right? Their work had impact. So sometimes it's very hard at the level you guys are all at, which is you know, usually two to five years into your careers, maybe a little more, um, to have really strong measurable impact. So the way to navigate that is to think about, because you're, you're on a project, you're not necessarily leading the entire thing, you're leading a piece of it. So ask yourself, how would your boss evaluate you? How would they know that you were doing a good job? You can't take credit for the overall project, but you can take credit for what you did. So did you complete your work ahead of time? Did your work play a key part in the upstream or the, the next level um, engagement? Did your work get borrowed by others? I've seen um, several clients who for their impact said model I built was rolled out to three other departments. Develop training which has now become standard across, across the company. I saw one that said, developed training, received feedback from senior leaders that new interns were able to add value faster than in any previous year. I know that person's work had value, okay? So again, start with the leadership word, then the target of that action, and then the impact. Here's one, all you engineers out there, I know there are a lot of you. Delivering software towards four core 5G modem chipsets, enabling user devices to establish and maintain the best wireless connection possible, accounting for various signal conditions and device mobility. There's a lot of jargon in there, okay? I don't really know the impact. And it's a little more, Technical. I mean, there's not a ton of jargon, but it doesn't really tell me as a, you know, I was an anthropology major who worked in, um, you know, process improvements. I don't look at this and I totally understand what the value is. So when you are coming from a very technical background, remember that it's not the programming language. It's not the four core 5G motor. Like it, that, that component is not important. What's important is the impact that you had. So here's a rewrite delivered software for 5G modem chipsets, which are used in cell phones, tablets, laptops, and routers globally to identify and establish connections with nearest network cell towers, integrated into 850 products, product lines worldwide. We're gonna pause here. I really want you to read this because I'm sure there are a lot of engineers on here. Do you see how much more understandable that second bullet point is? Okay, I understand why these chipsets are important. I have a cell phone, I have a tablet, I have a laptop and I have a router. So now I understand the impact. This is how I can relate to this. I like them when they have these you know, 
my devices have connections with network cell towers. Like that now is meaningful to me. And I know you did a good job with it because it was integrated into 850, 650 product lines worldwide, right? So you did made software that was valuable. Okay. I'm gonna stop here and tell, start taking your resume questions. There's one on how do you show gaps in jobs and during COVID layoffs? So when you write a resume, you do have to put the end date on it. So if there's a job gap, it will show, right? If you were laid off, um, by the way, a job gap is three months or more. So if you had less than three months, that's not a job gap. Like that was just, you switched jobs. That's not a big deal. So if you had a job gap of more than three months, your resume, you know, you could just put the years on the dates instead of um, the actual months that might get away from, from it. I would also think about what you did during that time. Uh, so if you were laid off for a significant period of time, but during that you did freelance consulting or you did extensive volunteer work, you can add that maybe to the bottom of your resume where you have that additional section. You could put additional volunteer experience or freelance consulting. If it's particularly significant, like you've had a year and a half of freelance consulting with real measurable results, I would put that as the most current job. Um, even if it's volunteer consulting, you know, you might put pro bono consulting on it. And then you'll want to write the optional essay or answer the question on the application that says, um, do you have, you have a job gap of more than three months? Explain it. The two key messages to remember. One, business schools totally understand layoffs and they understand COVID. It's not like you're the only ones who are experiencing all the tech layoffs today and all the COVID impact of the last couple of years. So they will be understanding. That being said, they want to know that you use that time well. Um, we had a blog post circulating way back, like during the, the financial crisis in 2009. It was called Lay Off Your Worries If You Use Your Time Well, which was a pun on the word layoffs. And essentially what it said was, if you sit around playing video games and studying for your GMAT, that's not a particularly good use of your time. I mean, obviously the GMAT is a good use, but that's not what they want to see. But if you use that time to um, visit your grandparents in another country who you hadn't seen for a while, or you use that time to um, take a couple of classes to upskill or to increase your volunteer work, then that is an effective use of your time. I'll give you two quick examples. I had a client who was years and years ago. He was in investment banking, had gone into it for his family pressure, did not really like it, switched investment banks, still didn't like it, um, tried to start an entrepreneurial venture. It failed, finally just took six months off, traveled around and decided what he really wanted to do was be an investment banker. And I remember the conversation, this goes back 10 years, and he said to me, how can I explain a six month gap when I went back to doing exactly the same thing. And we ended up writing about how he had gone into it for his parents, a lot of pressure from his ethnicity and you know, the oldest son. And when he came back to it, it was with this renewed vigor and that he had chosen it himself. So he no longer had the resentment and didn't like it because he was resentful of being there. Now he really approached it with a new attitude. And we talked about mindset. So. That was a great example. That gap didn't initially look like it did much for him, but in the end, it really did. Um, I had another, and that was built into the essay, by the way, and I think we just touched on it in the optional essay about job gaps. I had another client who was offered a huge promotion at a bank and suddenly realized that if she took it, that would kind of lock her in for life. She'd be too senior to ever go to a more junior role. So she took a six month leave spent a lot of time looking after some sick relatives, but also did a lot of soul searching and decided to turn the promotion down. So she wasn't working when we worked together, but she explained that during those six months, she had realized that what she needed to go do was go to business school. And, and she actually did have a standing offer to go back. So she was going to be going back to that job um, just for a few months and when uh, after the applications were in. So Essentially, the resume itself, you don't need to address it too much. You should address what you were doing, but you don't need to explain the gap. On the application itself, you'll need to explain any significant gap. Okay. Other questions, please post them in the comments. 
Anyone have a resume bullet point they are struggling with? I'm working in a conglomerate as a data analyst where I've shifted between companies depending on the demand and priority. How do I convey that in my resume? So, um, Anjani, great question. So, and actually I want to address this, so thank you. Um, you made me realize something else I wanted to say. So, um, you've been, if I understand correctly, you've worked for one conglomerate and they have moved you to different departments. So, a lot of people would assume that means they should put each department as a, each job as a separate section on their resume. That's going to send the message that you moved around all the time. If you put the conglomerate, so have worked for you know Tata Industries for um, since 2018 to present, and then under it, your bullet points describe each of the different engagements. Now it sends a message of, I've been at this one conglomerate for a long time and they really like me and they keep sending me on these engagements. And then you might have sub bullets under those of your impact, but have one overarching element and then the specific jobs under that. Same thing for promotions. This is really important. I should have made a separate slide for it. Um, if you have been promoted, don't list the company twice, but do list the job twice. So you've been at Procter & Gamble as a data analyst, and then you were promoted to senior analyst. So list Procter & Gamble, the overall dates, then senior analyst and your dates and your bullet points, and then uh, data analyst or initial analyst or junior analyst and your bullet points. What this does is it shows the, the business schools that this company likes you, they promoted you. So it sends a message. By breaking the bullet points out under each job, it also shows how your responsibilities have increased over time. So a lot of people are tempted to either list each job separately with the same company title and all that. That just, you know, initial first glance looks like you switch jobs all the time. You would much rather send a message of one company with multiple promotions. On the other hand, if you um, list all the bullet points under the most recent title or you list all the titles and then all the bullet points, they can't see how your job has grown okay, or how you have grown in that job. Okay, Anjani, does that help? What does a business school infer from five-year experience but at different um, companies, um, Pranabi? Um, it really depends. If it's been one year at each of five companies, that might be a concern. It might look like if they're all, it might look like you don't get along with people. It might look like um, you don't do a very good job and therefore you don't get promoted. Or it could look like you're in the entrepreneurship field or startup field where companies close and you have to move on. And you know that just is the nature of the work and that happens too. Or it could look like each job built on each other and added more and more depth. Uh, they're each in the same industry or you're clearly growing and learning in each. If you're concerned that the school will look and say, she doesn't get along with people, make sure you have a recommender from one of the previous jobs and ask both your recommenders to discuss your people skills and your interpersonal skills. You can offset that. So um, Pranavi, I can't say that automatically everyone is with five um, years and multiple companies is going to be seen the same way because maybe it was one year, one year, and then three years. Well, maybe that shows that you took a little while to get your feet under you and to figure out what you wanted to do and now you found a company that you like. Um, or maybe it's a completely different story depending. But those are the risk factors I would see with it. It's not necessarily a bad thing. It's not necessarily a good thing. It's just your story. And again, any specific questions like this, we can always um, talk at a free consultation. And there's a link in the chat for that. All right, Sankath, I have a master's in engineering. How do I justify that MBA is the right path? So great question. Not a resume question, but I'm happy to answer it. So the resume will just list the engineering degree. And by the way, you need to be honest. Right. You really have to show um, everything that's on there. If you didn't include the master's degree and then you got accepted and then the school did a background check and found that you had that master's degree and you had chosen not to tell them, even if it's completely positive that they that you, you know, sort of you did really well and there was no reason not to. You just didn't feel like it was relevant for them. The school will see that as poor judgment and you're likely to have that um, acceptance revoked. So be honest with them. Um, in terms of your career essay, 
you want to own that in terms of showing why the engineering is the next step. Um, the MBA is the next step after engineering. So you don't want to look like a degree collector, that you have no idea you got the engineering and now you're getting an MBA, but there's no connection between them and you don't really, you know, and maybe after that you'll get a PhD in English, right? Like you don't want that to be the impression. But if you can say, I got a master's in engineering, I learned some really key fundamental skills and I've been applying them in this kind of job. But as I've worked more and closely with product teams, or as my, I've seen the impact of my work and been the subject matter expert on, uh, on teams with, that also have uh, you know, marketers, I've realized that I want to expand my scope. And the MBA will help me do that in preparation for X job. So um, GMAT Club, can you go to our uh, publications and pull up the, a link to our personal statement guide? And if the rest of you can go and find it, it's free. It's like a 25, 30 page article on how to write the career essay. But fundamentally, you always want to think of that career essay as having four parts, short term goals, long term goals, how your background has prepared you and how the school will help you get there. So it's a gap essay and you're defining the gap by what career you choose. So you want that gap to be both ambitious and attainable. Essentially, for the career essay, you want to think of the recruit of the admissions officer as being the recruiter, right? So, Sunketh, if you went for a job um, in product management, you would not walk in and say, "Hey, I've been an engineer. Um, don't really know what product management is, but it sounds cool." I assume you wouldn't say that. Not if you wanted the job. You would say, "Through my engineering work, I've gotten closer and closer to the consumers, and I've really enjoyed understanding how the." users needs drive engineering decisions. Now I want to move into product management and these are the skills that I will bring and this is what I still need to learn, right? Like intuitively you would know how to sell yourself like that. So in an admissions office situation, it's the same thing. You're trying to send a message to the admissions office that you know where you wanna go, that recruiters will be excited to see you, that the school offers what you need to fill that gap. All that being said, while you do have to write about something in the career essay that has integrity that you could see yourself doing, no one's going to force you to do that. So put a stake in the ground that you could live with. But then if you want to do a radical career change when you get to business school, you should try for that. But just make sure that what you write about is something that you could see yourself doing. Sometimes the plan B makes the most sense for the essay. OK, more questions? And please, um, those of you who have asked questions, if my answers were not helpful, if you want more, let me know. If they did help, let me know that too, so I know that I've given you what you need. Sunketh, was that helpful? Okay, I'm not seeing more questions come in. So, oh, there's one. Yes, we do free consulta consultations. Patricia, do you have free consultations for people abroad? Absolutely. We do consultations with people all over the world. Basically, when you sign in, sign up for a consultation, um, they'll, well, our office will send you a link and then you can just look for the times that are available. And if there's no time that works with your calendar, just write back and say, I'm located in X and these are the best times. Can you find someone? And we'll we'll do that. We jump on that all the time. I would say about half our clients are abroad outside the US, maybe more. Um, all time zones. Okay. Good. Thank you, Pranabi. Um, Sanketh. You got more advice now. Good. I'm thank you. Thanks, Sanketh. Um, I'm not seeing more questions come in, although I am happy to take them. So I think I'll just Keep presenting on some more information and see if it helps you. Okay, and if you do have questions, go ahead and type them in. Um, okay, so let's talk about the application itself. Uh, I'm going to tell you a story about Joe, although you probably can't see it in the tiny little type, but Joe was not an MBA mission client. So 
Joe had spent hours on his GMAT and essays. He prepared for months, revised draft after draft, and felt that his essays showed his best work. An hour before the application deadline, he sat down to submit and suddenly realized that there was a long application with dozens of questions that he hadn't anticipated. Please don't be like Joe. The application is tedious, it's boring, and it's important. So it has demographic information, it has job descriptions, responsibilities, salary, it has activities, and there are hidden essays. Um, Kushal, I see your question. I'm not going to ignore it. I'm just going to finish a couple more slides, and then I'll come to when I get to a natural pause. I'll come to questions. So here's the strategy. I would create a Word or a Google Doc. Don't complete that application online. You're going to want to pull your information for other schools. So just you know, create a doc for it. Block off a couple of 30-minute sessions a week. This is not work that you do when your brain is energized and you're revved up. This is work that you do when you're exhausted and you really don't want to do anything more with applications, but you kind of feel guilty, right? You don't have a lot of brain power. So don't use that low brain power time to tackle a new GMAT problem or to write a first draft of a hard essay. Use it to just move your application forward. Right? The questions can be repetitive, but your answers shouldn't be. Obviously, there's going to be overlap, but um, here's an example. So a resume bullet point. Researched and wrote 50 speeches, greetings and toasts for the ambassador and chief, the deputy chief of MBA mission, seven of which were published in major news outlets. So you can see it follows that three part approach. Researched and wrote, leadership words, the action, the 50 speeches, greeting and toasts, right? And the impact, seven of which were published. On the resume, the, the application itself, there might be a short answer. What was the biggest challenge you faced in your position? I began writing for the ambassador before he arrived and took, took, officially took his post. Unable to beat him, I read his bio and watched the only video of him speaking online. I somehow find, found the right tone as he asked me to join his office full time. Okay. It's the same story, but it's a different part of the story. When the application asks for your job description or your job responsibilities, that's where you give the responsibilities, which are not in your resume because your resume is the impact, right? So there is a difference there. Um, there's the demographic information, name, address, may also ask for your parents' backgrounds, what their job's highest level of education. They are not judging you. They are trying to understand the context of your story. Job descriptions, responsibilities, achievements, and salary. Company descriptions can be pulled from the website. That's the one thing here that's easy. You do not have to write it. Responsibilities are different from achievements. And they want your starting and ending salaries, again, not because they're judging you, but because they need to at some point indicate how much people made and what the increase was and before and after. So they're clustering it under demographic information. They are not going to judge you. There are very rare occasions where it's a common company or common industry and they get a sense of how much you're valued by the bonus or the, or the raise, but it's a very small part of what they're looking for. And by the way, I applied to business school working in nonprofit. I made pennies. So, it's not, you know, and I got into great schools. So it's not like they, they judged me for that. I just really helped their numbers because when I went out, I had tripled my salary. Um, be honest, okay? It will be checked. If you get accepted, they do a background check. If you have made up your numbers or if you, you know, were not clear or honest about how you left the company, they will find you and they will ask you about it. That's not necessarily a ding. Um, they will give you a chance to explain. They want you to be successful once they've accepted you but they will ask you about it. Back to the question about job gap. Um, most of these um, job descriptions, they will ask, why did you leave the job? So if it's your current job, just say NA, you haven't left it. But if you were laid off, just say company closed due to COVID or 30% um, of the company was laid off due to the economic situation. And just explain it. Okay, so that's the other place. Um, just a couple more slides, Kushal, before I get to your question. Uh, there is a section there for activities. Uh, some schools will ask for activities, three in college and three since, some will not. Describe the organization and what you did. Um, and it's generally best to put most recent first, but balance with the biggest leadership. So I wouldn't start with something that finished in college five years ago, but I might make that the second if it was huge, okay? Hobbies can be included under the list of activities. 
And then there are often hidden essays. It's important to read the application through before you start brainstorming your essays. Because, for example, Kellogg asks a 450 word question to describe a time when you added value to an organization. And then they have a hidden essay of 240 characters on what's your most significant career accomplishment. You don't want to have the same topic for those two essays. You want to teach them more about yourself. So if you haven't planned out all those hidden essays ahead of time, uh, you're, you might choose the wrong topics or you know, other topics than you would have for the main essays. And then there is the optional essay. This is an opportunity to explain low grades, job gap, how your bonus was calculated, why you don't offer resume recommendation from your supervisor. Um, keep it factual and direct. Okay. Pause here. I'm going to take a couple questions. Kushal, I've worked in multiple um, projects in the EPC industry. How do I put them in? Do I need to put the descriptions project-wise or a general description would do? So um, I don't have an exact answer. I think that if all the projects followed a very similar nature, then maybe you could put an overarching bullet point that says, all EPC projects focus on ABC and involve skills like blah, 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 right? That's an overview. That's not an impact. That's just a description because maybe it's not as familiar to other people. And then you could have a bullet point that described each of the, the impact in each of your jobs. It should be that the way you write the bullet points tells them what you do, right? Like you don't have to say manage ad campaign as your job description. I know that's not you. Because when you write that job that ad campaign with bullet points, you would say initiated and led ad campaign, which delivered blah, blah, blah results, right? So the description of what you do should be embedded in the bullet point because of how you tell it. That's why you don't need to have a job description in there. But um, if in your case, Kushal, I would really focus on how each one was different. What skills did you bring to the table, right? Who did you interact with? You, you know, differentiate them to the extent possible so that they see you in a more holistic way. Let me know if that helped because I'm not completely sure it, it was as thorough as you want. Okay, Abhishek, I have nine years of experience in government in India and handling public finance management for government in India. Before that, I was an accomplished engineer with um, PSU and um, MNC 15 years experience. How do I build in varied industry experience? Well, sounds like you've been out of school for a while, Abhishek. So are you applying, if you're applying to EMBA, then you could do a two page resume. If not, I would probably split that resume into two, you know, government slash public finance experience and then um, engineering experience, but give more space to the current activities. For the engineering experience, maybe it's just, uh, you don't even have to list it in the, the way you would. Maybe you don't list the company name and then the location and then your title and then under that the bullet points. Maybe it's just a bullet point that says company name, your title, and then one major bullet point and the dates. And then immediately under that, another bullet point. So the emphasis is on the, the, the last nine years, but you're showing that you did work for these other companies earlier. Okay, so the, the proportion of space that you give your resume tells a story too. If you only have you know, two lines, four lines for a current job, but your first job out of school six years ago has 10 lines, you're sending the wrong message. You're sending a message that the experience you had six years ago was more relevant, more impactful than what you're doing now. So in your case, since those engineering and MNC jobs were so long ago, I would just minimize them on your resume. If you really don't have space to include them because you've just done so much in public finance, then maybe under that additional section, I could you, you might want to put additional work experience and then you know, uh, six years at MNC and four years at an engineering firm, and then on the application itself, explain it. But I'd rather see it on that resume. Okay. Uh, let me know if that helps. Thanks, Kushal. I'm glad that was helpful. Okay, we've got about 10 more minutes of the scheduled time. So I'll pause again for questions, and if not, I can... Go back to my slides. Great. All right. Okay. Um, so I said we were even talking about the qualification documents and uh, components of the application, which is the resume, the um, application itself, your GMAT, your GRE score, your GPA, and your um, any additional designations, Sigma certification, engineering licenses, things like that. The other part of the application is the why, the selection, who are you, right? 
Uh, I'm going to stop here because I do see another question and this and I'm seeing more questions come in, so we might not get to this. So um, how much does age really matter? I want a full-time MBA, but I see the cap with 30. 30 is not a cap at all. It tends to be a number that people hear and they think, oh, I'm too old, but it's really not. Um, I helped a 38 year old get into school. I helped a 36 year old get into school. It's more, what have you done with yourself during that time? Why are you applying now at 30 or 32, whatever, right? If your career is stagnated and you've never really done that much, that's not, you know, being older does not help. But if your career was going great, and then just as you were going to apply two years ago, you got some huge project that really leads you in the direction of your career, or if you were going to apply, but COVID hit and you had to delay for a couple of years, you can explain that. Um, but there's no cutoff. Uh, I remember talking to a military applicant who said, I had a 10 year commitment to the military, so now I'm 32. It just, it's awful for the applications. And I said to him, which would have been better? A dishonorable discharge because you broke your contract or being 32. He's like being 32 is a lot better. So it's much more about what you've done. I had a client whose family went bankrupt when he was about to apply to business schools at 28. And it took him two years of running the family business to get them back on track. And so then he's, he was now 30 and literally just as he was about to apply again, his company asked him to take a year to run this really big project that was directly preparing him for his career goals. So he did that and he applied at 32 and he got into some great schools, top five schools. So it's not a cutoff. It's just what you've done that matters. Okay, I hope that's reassuring. Um, do I put freelance jobs as work experience? Melissa, yes. But how you do that could be different depending on what story you're trying to tell. So if you're not employed now, except for your freelance work, then I would absolutely put that on as your current job. Right. Again, focusing on the impact so they know that it's legitimate. If it's something that you've done on the side because you're working towards a particular industry change or um, or or um, entrepreneurship, I would also list that, but I would probably list it in the second work section. So I put what might put experience and then your full-time jobs and then entrepreneurship or um, marketing experience or something what you're trying to show or you're know, marketing freelance. If you're trying to send a message that this is something I'm trying to build experience in. And the third option is if it's just kind of your random freelance work, like you just did it for fun, then probably under additional. So you have experience, education, and then additional. I might have as an additional, a first bullet point that says uh, freelance work experience, and then the description there. So again, just to recap, if you're send, if that's what you're doing now, it's your main focus, put it as the main focus. If it's building towards a career that you want, put it as a secondary focus within the work experience. And if it's just something that you do for an interest of yours or for fun, build that under the additional. Okay. Um, I'm so glad that was reassuring on the age. It's first of all, and this is sort of my philosophy about business school in general. Let's say I had told you that, yeah, 30 is a little bit rough and, and I'm not saying this as easy to get in at 30, but it's not a deal breaker either. Um, but let's say I had said to you, yeah, that's really bad. What are you going to do? Unless you know how to get younger, you're not going to be able to do anything about it. And by the way, if you do know how to get younger, don't go to business school. Just share that with me, please. So, you know, it's not you can't control that. You can't control where you went to college. You can't control if your parents didn't have college education. This is just part of your story. You can't change it. There's so much to worry about in the application process. Don't worry about the stuff you have no control over. Right. You're not going to get younger. Um, okay, I have a postgraduate diploma in management, which is slightly similar to an MBA, which schools look at as a red flag. So, um, Fenindra, there's a, a couple of elements here that it's important to think through. One is some schools don't allow you to get a second MBA. Um, there are lists of them out there. I don't know if your management or your certificate would categor be categorized as an MBA. My guess is that it would not be and that all schools are open to you. But if there's a school that you're really excited about and you see that they say they don't take second MBAs, you need to call them before you apply just because why go through that effort if they're gonna say, yes, we consider your diploma the same as an MBA. My guess is that won't happen, but you do wanna check. Now, if you have a second MBA or in your case, a certificate and you are applying, you want to be able to clearly articulate what your degree was lacking that the MBA will fill. Usually when I see that, it's um, said it's because people got that certificate or that MBA immediately out of college. They didn't have work experience. They didn't have global experience. Their MBA was very focused on just you know, functional skills or domestic skills. 
and they've realized now that they've been working for a few years that they need more a broader perspective and that's generally how it's positioned so whether that's in the career essay or in the additional essay the optional essay you'll have to see how the, the story flows and what the reasons are um, but if they permit you to apply with that certificate that's just the explanation it actually is not dissimilar to the earlier question on the master's in engineering you need to show that there's a reason for it right why do you do an mba when you already have a master's because you're, it moves you forward in your career why do you need another mba when you have a certificate because there was something that that degree didn't give you and you need it to move forward And I have seen plenty of applicants. In fact, schools will usually put in their career profile the percentage of the class profile, percentage of students with advanced degrees, and it's usually roughly between 15 and 20 ish percent. So they have masters, they have PhDs. If you have a PhD, you usually got a master's along the way. I've worked with plenty of people who have those degrees. Uh, I've worked with lawyers who are switching, um, doctors. You know, it's, it's as long as there's a logical reason in the story, then um, there's no issue with it. You just have to explain it. Um, I think I am not going to go, I cannot do justice to the rest of this presentation in the three minutes we have left. So I will be happy to take questions or I can slide ahead and talk a little bit about us. I guess I'll do that while we wait. Um, see if I have a slide here. Um, see, I could not have gone through this. Yes. Yeah, so here's MBA mission. Um, we offer free interview primers, free insider's guides. There's an interview chapter um, in the start to finish guide that's really valuable. Um, I don't know why this is all about interviews. Um, that's what I was looking for. We are named number one by Poets and Quants with the highest rated firm on GMAT Club by more than 500 reviews. Just only admissions firm recommended by um, Manhattan Prep. Uh, we are already working for you through this presentation. All, almost all of our publications are free. There's only one that's costs. Um, there's just a ton of stuff. We also have a ton of presentations. You can uh, go to these presentations. You can download our insider's guides, our primers. Please look at our insider's guides. We have a whole research team that writes these long books about each of the top 20 programs every year. We have interview primers. If you get an interview, you can download a 20-page book on how the interviews are done for your school, including sample questions that have been asked in actual recent interviews. You can certainly do the consultation. Um, these are our services. These are some cool people on my team. Uh, Katie went to Harvard Business School and Harvard Law School, worked at McKinsey, and was an admissions reader for Stanford. Rachel, I put up because she's got the coolest, most relevant background. She was a business reporter. That means she had to go interview business people about complex ideas and then present it in its form that would be understood by the general public, so no jargon, under tight timelines and tight time count. Uh, we hired Rachel when we didn't even have a spot open because we knew we needed her and we figured that eventually someone would leave. She's now been here 11 years. Um, that is us. And uh, our website has a blog with admissions interviews, essay analysis for every school, lots of bullet points, uh, blog posts about resumes, about interviews, just really help interviews with faculty. Um, lots of ways to try us, lots of free resources for you. So that is it for me, unless there are other questions in the next minute or so. Okie doke. I hope to see you all at future presentations. I hope to see you in free consultations and I wish you all the absolute best of luck with your applications. Okay, and let us know if we can help. Good luck. Bye.